This is WBGU-FM on 88.1 and HD1, Bowling Green, Ohio. The Ohio Renaissance Festival returns for its 29th season at Renaissance Park Event Center in Waynesville, Ohio. Every Saturday and Sunday between September 1st and October 28th, as well as Labor Day weekend. There will be hearty food and drink fit for royalty, 14 stages of endless entertainment including swashbuckling pirates, knights in shining armor, dueling swordsmen, and so much more. Follow WBGU-FM on Facebook for more information on how to win free tickets. Hello, hello, hello. There I am. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is DJ Mick, and this is a weird edition of A Sherlock Summer. This is not my usual time because I missed my time last night. Um, or yesterday afternoon, I should say. Usually it's Sunday 4 to 6, but I missed that slot. And so now I'm doing it today from 2 to 4. Consequentially, um, actually not consequentially, incidentally, I also have my other show tonight from 8 to 10 that I totally forgot about. But that's also happening. That's a music show. This is a show where I play old-time radio uh, Sherlock Holmes story specifically. So that is actually what is going to be happening today. And there was something that I wanted to play before I even started talking and I totally forgot about it. So we'll do it. We'll do it. In a, we'll do it at the top of the next hour. We'll do it at the top of the three o'clock hour. And I will remember this time. Anyway, if you've listened to my show before, you know the drill. I play three uh, radio adventures. They're about 20, 20 to 30 minutes long, kind of varies. Um, and so the first one that we're going to listen to is called The Speckled Band. This is one of my absolute favorites. It is so creepy and wrong. And the, it's just, it's so dramatic. I love this one. It is pretty scary though. Not not a lot of like gory violent or anything like that, but it's just it's spooky. It's spooky scary. So here without further ado is the speckled band here on a Sherlock Summer, the weird time and day edition on WPGU FM. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, here we are once again in Dr. Watson's study. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. What incident are you going to tell us about this evening, Dr. Watson? Well, uh, now, th- I, I haven't quite decided. Uh, suppose that we... What was that? Oh, this is the fire. Top log has fallen off. Where did I put that poker? Oh, here it is. There we go. Ah, that's better. Oh, what a curious old poker, Dr. Watson. It looks as though it had been seen many years of service. Yeah, so it has, my dear fellow, so it has. It belonged to Sherlock Holmes himself in the days when we were sharing rooms in Baker Street. <laughs> you know that? I think I could do no better than to tell you the particular incident that that poker recalls to my mind. Well, please do. I can't recall any case which presented more singular features than that which we always referred to as the adventure of the speckled band. Speckled band? What does that mean, Dr. Watson? We'll get to that in a minute, Mr. Bell. But uh, first... Men, hot summer days are with us again. And after a day spent under a hot, broiling sun, does your hair look as stiff as straw, dry, matted, or tangled? Does the humidity make it stringy and look rumpled and unattractive? Then don't make the mistake of plastering your hair down with greasy, sticky goo. Instead, put Kreml hair tonic on the job. Kreml is that famous modern hair tonic, such a wonderful, natural-looking hairdressing. Kreml has just enough light oils to keep dry, stringy hair neatly groomed throughout the hottest, stickiest day. Yet Kreml never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy. It never leaves any unpleasant odor. Kreml always feels clean on both hair and scalp. 
You see, Kreml is able to give you all these advantages because it contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. So men, make Kreml a daily must this summer for that handsome, clean-cut look from morning till night. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the adventure of the speckled band? It was early one April morning, very early, I might say. Holmes, as you doubtless know, was a notoriously late riser. So you can imagine my surprise to find him standing fully dressed by the side of my bed. Watson, I say, Watson, wake up. Uh, uh, Watson, uh, old fellow, if you don't manage to wake uh, up immediately, I shall be obliged to enter the contents of this water pitcher over you. Uh, what, what's up? Is, is there a fire? No, a client. Oh, a client? Quite so, a client. It's um, a girl, a rather charming-looking girl. She is waiting in the sitting room now. Oh, she? Here, I'll uh, open the door crack so you can take a look at her. Hmm. Lady dressed in black and uh, so heavily veiled that you can't tell a thing about her. Where's my other slipper? On the contrary, my dear Watson, we can gather a great deal about her. Here's your slipper on the table where you left it last night as a paperweight. Uh, your tie, your good tie, is on the third shelf behind Boswell's Life of Johnson. I presume that's the one you want, and as much as it's the one you always wear when you wish to make an impression on one of the opposite sex. Don't be silly, old man. Uh, but to return to the young lady, she left home very early this morning, came by train, and yet she had a good drive in a dog cart along heavy roads before she reached the station. Holmes, you're trying to be uncanny again. Not at all, my dear Watson. It's as plain as the nose on your face. The left arm of her jacket is patted with mud. There's no vehicle save a dog cart which throws up mud in that disgusting way. As for the train journey, I observed the second half of the return ticket in the palm of the left glove. Oh, I never even saw it. Oh, yes, you did, Watson. You merely did not notice it. Well, that's all very interesting, but I think we've kept the young lady waiting on enough. Shall we go into her? Uh, by all means. You go first. You're certain to create the more favorable impression. Oh, thank you so much. <clears throat> Good morning. Oh, is, is this Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I'm that gentleman. This is my intimate friend and associate, Dr. Watson. How do you do? You may speak freely before him. Oh, I see. Won't you sit down by the fire? I observe that you're shivering. No, thank you. It's not the cold that makes me shiver. Oh? What then? This fear, Mr. Holmes. This terror. I can stand this strain no longer. I had to come to you. I shall be happy, madam, to devote myself to your case if you'll just lay before us um, everything that may help us in forming an opinion on the matter. My, my name is Helen Stoner. I'm living with my stepfather, who is the last survivor of the Royalists of Stoke Moran, an old Saxon family. Oh, I say, Holmes, I, I heard of him. He's a doctor, isn't he? Went out to Calcutta. Yes, that is my stepfather. Oh. While in India, he married my mother, the young widow of Major General Stoner. My sister Julia and I were twins. We were only two at the time of the marriage. Uh, you were brought up in India then? No. Dr. Rollett was forced to return to this country due to a scandal. A scandal? Oh, oh really? Watson, don't interrupt. Well, what was a scandal? Mm -hmm. Shortly after that, my, uh, my mother died, leaving about 2,000 pounds a year to Dr. Rollett as long as we, my sister and I, resided with him. However, in the event of our marriage, we were to receive 550 a year apiece. And uh, did either of you marry? No. As a matter of fact, after Mother's death, a terrible change came over Dr. Roylott. He quarreled violently with everyone in the neighborhood, so that we were left almost entirely to ourselves. His only friends are a band of wandering gypsies whom he permits to encamp on the property from time to time. He also has a passion for Indian animals. Extraordinary. At this moment, he owns a cheetah and a baboon. Hmm. Not very cheerful surroundings for two young women. Oh, one gets used to things. The only person we were allowed to visit was a sister of mother's. While Julie was there, she met the man to whom she became engaged. I see, and of course your stepfather objected violently. No. No, surprisingly enough, he did not. Oh? He offered no objections whatever to the marriage. But I thought that you said that neither of you had, uh, had ever married. So I did, Dr. Watson. Julia did not marry because within a fortnight of the day which had been fixed for the wedding, she... she died. Died? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Under the most horrible circumstances. Uh, can you describe this unfortunate event in detail? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. Every second of that dread time is seared in my memory. The bedrooms at Stoke Moran are on the ground floor. They open off a common passage. Of these bedrooms, the first is Dr. Roylott's, the second my sister's, and the third my own. 
I see. There's no communication between them. Do I make myself clear? Perfectly so. Uh, the windows of the three rooms open out on the lawn. The fatal night, we'd all gone to our rooms early, having carefully locked our bedroom doors on account of the cheetah and a baboon, which were allowed to wander about at will. Suddenly, as I was about to blow out my light, I heard Julia knocking at my door. <laughs> Just a minute, I'll unlock the door. Why, Julia, you look as pale as a sheet. What's the matter? Oh, nothing. At least, nothing I can put my finger on. Maybe it's the wind and the rain. Oh, lock the door, Helen. I, I'm afraid. Afraid? Whatever of? Well, I, I really don't know. I, I feel what the Irish call say, as though death were lurking around the corner. Something seems to keep trying to warn me. Oh, nonsense, Julia. You're upset. Perhaps the excitement over your wedding. Why aren't you asleep? Well, I... I can't. Father keeps pacing up and down next door. But it's not that. It, it's... It's what? Tell me, Helen. Have you ever heard anyone whistle in the dead of night? Never. I... I don't suppose it could be you in your sleep. Oh, Julia, don't be absurd. Well... The last few nights I've heard it. A low, clear whistle. About three in the morning. And for some reason, it, it seems to be warning me. Well, it might be those wretched gypsies in the plantation. Oh, probably. And yet, if it were on the lawn, I wonder that you didn't hear it, too. Oh, you know how soundly I sleep. Oh, well, uh, I'm probably being very foolish. I'll go back to bed and let you get some sleep. Helen? Yes, what is it? Would you... Would you mind standing here until you hear me lock my door? Of course not, silly. Well, good night. Good night, you goose. There. Gracious, she's getting jumpy. She'll be glad when she's safely married. Listen to that wind. What was that? <sighs> Nothing. I'm getting as nervous as Julia. I hope nothing. <coughs> Julia! Julia, what's the matter? <coughs> there was a whistle. I heard it. Julia! Julia, open the door! Julia! <gasps> Julia, what's uh, happened? Uh, Don't stagger like that, darling. I'm coming to you. Uh, it's, it's the band. The speckled band. Julia! <coughs> Julia, what do you mean? Oh, and what was found in your sister's room? That's a strange part. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. The windows were barred by old-fashioned shutters with broad iron bars, and the door was locked on the inside. My sister was alone when she met her doom. Mm. Any marks of violence? None. What about poison? The doctors examined her for it, but without success. It's my belief that my sister died of fright. Pure fright. When did all this happen? About two years ago. And why do you come to me at this late date? Well, I myself am expecting to be married shortly to a man I've known for many years. Uh, two days ago, some repairs were started in the west wing of the building so that I'd been forced to move into the room where my sister died sleep in the very bed in which she slept. Imagine, then, my thrill of terror when last night, as I lay awake thinking over her terrible fate, I suddenly heard the low whistle which heralded her death. Good gracious, Mary. Uh, quiet, Watson. I jumped up, lit the light, but could find nothing. I came straight to you as soon as it was daylight. Mm, if we were to come down to Stoke Moran today, would it be possible to look over these rooms without the knowledge of your stepfather? He spoke of coming into town today on some important business. It's probable that he will be away all day. Excellent. You may expect us, then, sometime this afternoon, if that is convenient. Oh, yes. Oh, thank you so very much. I shall look forward to seeing you again this afternoon. Goodbye, Jeff. Goodbye, goodbye. Well, my dear Holmes, what do you think of it all? What do you make of the sister's dying words, the speckled band? Mm. It may merely have been the effect of delirium. 
Or it may have referred to the band of gypsies who sometimes wear spotted kerchiefs. Then again, it may be something much more deadly. Dear, 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 someone seems to be very anxious to see us. Now come in. Which of you is Holmes? That is my name, sir. I am Dr. Grimesby Royalett of Stoke Moran. Indeed. Pray take a seat. I will do nothing of the kind. My stepdaughter has been here. I traced her. What did she say to you? It's um, a little cold for this time of year. You put me off, do you? I've heard of you before. You're Holmes, the meddler. <laughs> Holmes, the busybody. Holmes, the Scotland Yard jack in office. My dear doctor, all this does not alter the fact that it is still decidedly chilly. I seem to feel a draft. Uh, would you mind uh, closing the door from the outside? I will go when I've had my say. Don't meddle with my affairs. You'll find I'm a dangerous man to fall foul of. Look here. Look out, Holmes. He's got the poker. Watch this. I say, Holmes, he's bent our poker almost double. My dear fellow, give me that poker. I really can't allow you, sir, to go around breaking up our little household, even if you are a good 40 pounds heavier than I am. Allow me. Good heavens, Holmes, you've straightened the blasted thing out again. Well, I'll... I'll... Just the same. Look out for me. Both of you. Charming fellow. Quite. And now, Watson, breakfast. Then I have one or two errands to do. After that, suppose you meet me at Waterloo Station at about um, half past eleven. Right, you are, Holmes. I'll be there on the dot. And uh, you might slip your service revolver into your pocket. It's an excellent argument with a gentleman who can twist pokers into knots. Just a moment, we'll see what awaits Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson on their visit to Dr. Roylott's home, Stoke Moran. Are you one of the many men who find it difficult to keep your hair neatly groomed in summer? Does the burning sun bake and scorch your hair, making it look messy and not the least attractive? Then try Cremel Hair Tonic. Just notice the amazing change in the appearance of your hair. You see, Cremel does lots more than just keep your hair looking handsome. This highly specialized hair tonic gives you your money's worth. It contains a unique combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Cremel is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And if the sun dries your hair so that it breaks off and falls, Cremel helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer and more pliable when you comb it. At the same time, Cremel removes itchy, loose dandruff and leaves the scalp feeling so cool, refreshed, and alive. So be smart, men. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kreml daily for better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, you were to meet Sherlock Holmes at Waterloo Station. Is that right? Quite right, Mr. Bell. And an hour or so afterwards, found us walking in a country lane. Got a match, Holmes? What a perfect day for a walk in the country. I'm glad you enjoyed. Isn't that a house poking its head above those trees over there? Yes, that must be Stoke Moran, the home of our genial friend, Dr. Roylott. I fancy we'll find it shorter to go across the field, and uh, safer in case the good doctor has returned home. Yes, there's a stile over there where the, where the lady is walking. And the lady, I fancy, is Miss Stoner. Oh, no, my dear Watson, don't try to vault the fence. Remember, hmm? you're getting a bit plump. Oh, rubbish. Better climb the stile sedately, as I'm doing. That's it. Good afternoon, Miss Stoner. You see, we've been as good as our word. I've been waiting so eagerly for you. Everything has turned out splendidly. Dr. Rollett has gone to town, and I don't expect him back before evening. We had the uh, pleasure of making the good doctor's acquaintance. Good heavens, he follows me. What will he say when he returns? You must lock yourself in your room tonight. If he is violent, we shall take you to your aunt's at Harrow. Uh, don't you think we'd better be getting on with our business before that appalling fellow comes crashing home? Quite. Hmm. Handsome old house. I uh, see you're doing some repairs. Yes. This is the wall of my own room that they're working on. Quite. By the way, this wall seems to be in pretty good condition. Hmm. And this, um, the center room was your sister's, I take it? Yes. I'm sleeping there for the present. We can enter it by way of the uh, French window. Uh, first of all, if you'll be good enough to go inside and lower the iron shutter, I'd like to see just how impregnable it is. Oh, certainly, Mr. Holmes. Just a moment. Hmm, yes. It seems to be quite impossible. 
You may raise it again. May we come in? Please do. This is the room, just as she used to have it. Mm. Chest of drawers, bed, dressing table, two wicker chairs. Nothing very extraordinary, huh? Wait a minute. I say the bed's nailed to the floor. It's immovable. I never noticed that. The long cord. It's a bell pull, isn't it? Yes. What does it communicate with? The housekeeper's room. But I don't think my sister ever used it. It seems newer than the other things. Yes, it was put up about two years ago. Do you mind if I give it a pull? Certainly not. Uh Uh-huh. As I thought. It's a dummy. Dummy? You mean that it won't ring? No, Watson. It definitely won't ring. It's not even attached to a wire. Hmm. Very interesting. It seems to be securely fastened just above the opening of that little ventilator. Oh, that ventilator was built several years ago, too. It goes into Father's room. I see. Uh, suppose we take a peek at the doctor's room. Certainly. Come this way. Yeah, I wish you'd hurry, Holmes. I'm getting a bit jumpy. What if the doctor should decide to come home? This is my father's room. Mm. Nothing very exciting in here. Just the usual man's bedroom. Except for the safe. You don't by any chance know what he keeps in there, do you, Miss Stoner? Oh, business papers, I think. I've only seen the inside of it once, and that was some years ago. Uh, There isn't a cat in it by any chance. No. What a strange idea. Well, look at the saucer of milk. No, we don't keep a cat. But, of course, there's a cheetah and a baboon. Uh, Mr. Holmes, look here at this vicious-looking little whip. Yes, I noticed that. The interesting point is that it is curled upon itself and tied so as to make a small noose of whipcord. Hello? What's that? I thought I heard a carriage. Yes, by Jove. Must be the doctor coming home. Oh, go, please. Quickly, before he finds you here. First of all, promise to do as I tell you. Your life may depend on it. I'll do whatever you say. Dr. Watson and I must spend the night in your room. Mr. Holmes. Let me explain. We will hide at the lower end of the meadow. We can see your window from there. You must lock yourself in on pretense of a headache. When you hear your father retire to his room for the night, open the shutters of a window. Put your lamp there as a signal to us. And then withdraw into the room you used to occupy. <laughs> The rest you must leave in our hands. Yes, yes, I will. Only please go now. No, 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 not that way. Here, through the window. I say, Holmes. Do we have to wait in this blasted meadow all night? I'm chilled to the bone in this wind. Why can't we go down to the inn? I'm sure we can see the windows of Stoke Moran just as well from there. Impossible, Watson. When the time comes, we must go and go quickly. A human life may depend on the speed with which we can reach the house. I say, you give me the creeps. What's that? Look, you see it? There in the bushes. A ghastly misshapen figure. Hmm. Must have been the baboon. Look, Watson. The middle window. By Jove, it's our signal. The lamp. Come along. Hurry. And walk quietly. So dark, I, I can hardly see her. I think there'll be a storm coming. Uh, just listen to that wind. Here we are. Step inside through the window. No noise. I shall sit on the bed. You will sit in that chair. Ready? I'm going to turn up the lamp. I say, Holmes. Shh. The least sound would be fatal to our plans. Have you your revolver handy? Yes. Good. Whatever you do, don't go to sleep. Your life may depend on it. Eleven o'clock. Yes. We're in for a long and dreadful vigil. Ventilator. A 
gleam of light. Now it's gone again. Wait, wait. Things are beginning to move. Quiet now. What, what's that? Quick, strike a match. Strike a match, Watson. There it is, the filthy thing. There, take that and that. Holmes, that. what is it? For the love of heaven, why are you slashing that bell pool with your whip? You saw it, Watson? You saw it? Aha, uh -huh, my friend, too late, too late. Ah, oh, how ghastly, how perfectly vile. No! No! Oh! Holmes, what does that mean? It means that it's all over, and I think for the best. Come, we shall enter Dr. Roylott's room. Keep your pistol handy. Come quickly. But Holmes, the door's locked. Break it in. Wait, I'll help you. Now then, one, two, three. Holmes. Holmes, look. On the floor, the doctor. He's dead. Good heavens. What a ghastly look on his face. As I expected. Do you see that? The, the band round his forehead? That, Watson, is the speckled band. Great thunder, it's moving. It's a snake. Yes, a swamp adder. The deadliest snake in India. The doctor died within ten seconds of being bitten. Here, hand me that dog whip with the noose. Look out, Watson. Don't go near. That's better. Hey, uh, what are you going to do? The noose goes over the reptile's head. So. And we lift it into the safe. So, and close the door. Ugh. I think I'm going to be sick. Mm, no wonder. The doctor's thrust his little playfellow through that ventilator for the last time, I fancy. But look here, Holmes. I, I still don't quite understand. I... It's all quite simple, my dear Watson. Amazingly simple. Our good doctor made use of the reptile to remove his stepdaughter when she threatened to get married and deprive him of her income. That snake has been living in the safe for some time, I imagine. The saucer of milk was its daily ration. Yes, but how did he succeed? I mean, by, by what method? Look at that chair. He must have been standing on that chair. Notice the heel marks, Watson. He thrust the slimy thing through the ventilator into the next room, being careful not to touch it with his hands, but to use the whip as you saw me do. It was the noose on the lash of the whip that convinced me this afternoon that we were on the right track. I see. That was why the bell pull was attached to the ventilator in the other room, so that the snake could crawl down. Exactly. And that was why the bed was nailed within reach of the bell pull. Oh, the filthy beast. The first attempt was not successful in the case of either sister. The doctor, fearing this might happen, had trained the adder to return when he whistled so that he could try again. And then it must have been his whistle we heard when you began slashing at the bell pull. Quite, my dear Watson. When he heard us, he wanted to recall it. But it was too late. The reptile had already thrust its venomous head through the ventilator when I began to slash at it. The snake turned back so enraged that it attacked the first thing it came in contact with, which, uh, by mere coincidence, happened to be its master. If I would look here, Holmes... Doesn't that make you indirectly responsible for the death of Dr. Roylott? Possibly, my dear Watson, possibly. But I cannot say that it is likely to weigh very heavily upon my conscience. Ladies, here's a sensational beauty tip direct from Hollywood. When you want your hair to look its radiant best for an important date, just do this the night before. Give your hair a 10-minute glamour bath with Cremel Shampoo. I certainly agree with that, Mr. Bell. And you know, Cremel Shampoo is the same shampoo used by those famous beauties, the Powers model. Cremel Shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays that way for days. And please bear in mind that Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It is not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. Not a harsh soap. It's entirely different. Yes, Cremel shampoo uncovers all the natural highlights that lie concealed in every woman's hair. Yet it never dries the hair. In fact, Cremel Shampoo has a built-in oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. It removes dandruff flakes the first time you use it. Cremel Shampoo whips up a luxuriant active foam, even in the hardest water. It rinses out so easily. 
and never leaves any dull, soapy film. So, ladies, why not buy a bottle of Cremel shampoo at any drug counter and glamour bathe your hair to a vision of tantalizing loveliness? K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell you a most bizarre and extraordinary story about a murder that was committed under our very eyes in our own flat. In Baker Street? Good heavens, that certainly was unusual. <laughs> Not only was murder committed, but the murderer was later acquitted in court. If it hadn't been for Holmes's brilliant detective work, I... Oh, well, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll tell you all about that next week. I call it The Adventure of the Innocent Murderers. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Speckled Band. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of Universal International Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the innocent murderous. Full-time civilians, part-time sailors. That's a thumbnail sketch of the Naval Air Reserve, which this week celebrates its first post-war birthday. 30,000 strong Naval Air Reserve stands ready to man the carriers and the planes of the reserve fleet should any national emergency arise. We doff our hats to the reserves of Naval Aviation, the officers and men of Naval Air Reserve on this, their first post-war birthday. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. WBGUFM is brought to you by Aardvark Screen Printing and Embroidery. Want to print a funny family quote on a mug or get some matching t-shirts for a family reunion? Aardvark Screen Printing and Embroidery can help. A veteran-owned family business serving the community for more than 25 years. Located at 123 South Main Street, Bowling Green, Ohio, and always open at aardvarkspe.com. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that adventure as much as I did, The Speckled Band. And that first aired on June 23rd, so a couple days ago, 1947. All right, well, let's take a look at the weather. So today, high of 75, low of 58, looks like tonight. Uh, tomorrow, which is Tuesday, um, evening thunderstorms, high of 84, uh, low of 70. So a bit warmer tomorrow. And Wednesday, also thunderstorms, high of 82, low of 65. So it looks like there might be a bit of a, a couple couple rainy days coming up. But today, it's, it's pretty nice, actually. So as for events, we have some dogs that are available for adoption at the Wood County Humane Society. I was just there this morning uh, walking a bunch of them. So I'll just go through. And this is all available on their Facebook page. Available Dogs 2018. So we have Jerrica, who's a one-year-old female mixed breed doggy. She's black with uh, kind of like a white stripe in her underbelly, which is pretty common for a lot of animals. Um, she's extremely cute. She is very energetic. Um, she's not too fond of other dogs, but humans she's fine with. I walked her and she was perfectly fine. And then we have Tic Tac, who's also a one-year-old female mixed breed. Um, and she's kind of a more shaggy fur. She's tan with uh, white, about half and half. Um, and she's very lovable, likes to kind of kind of clamber onto your lap and lick your face. Um, she also is not too big of a fan of other dogs. But there are some where she'll go right up to them and sniff and no barking, nothing at all. Same with Jerrica. It just, just kind of depends. Then we have Winchester, who is by far the best 
like easiest walker that I've ever walked. He's a three-year-old male mixed breed. Um, he's all tan and he has kind of like the bristly short fur, um, big floppy ears. He's very, very good. And if you like tap, like tap your chest, he'll, um, like reach his arms up, like stand up and like put his arms on you and like, like a hug. It's basically like a hug. He's very loving. And then there's Spigot and he's a one-year-old male mixed breed. He's some sort of hound, um, because he has that like Oh, thing then going on and the really big, really floppy ears and the kind of jowly. Yeah, he's real cute. And he's a he's a pretty good walker, too. He really likes to he has his nose to the ground, um, but he's very sweet, very sweet boy. Then there's uh, Zola and Zuma. Um, they're sisters. So Zola is two years old and Zuma is one. Um, they're all black. Um, they're somewhat small, like medium to small doggies. And they came uh, from Tennessee to us and they were feral at first uh, but now they're getting more and more used to human interaction so I walked both of them today and um, they walked real well they were very very uh, they're very good girls they looked back at me and they would walk a couple steps and then look back like is this right is this what a walk is, is that, am I doing it right and yes they were very cute all right and then we've got Alvin he's back um, he's a one-year-old male mixed breed, um, black on top with, uh, kind of like white patches and stuff like that. He's real cute, very energetic, uh, likes to jump up on you, things like that. Um, he's very loving. Um, I took him to the Firefly Nights thing that happened last week, two weeks ago, something, something like that. Um, and he, he was at our booth and he, you know, sniffed everybody and was very loving and gave licks and everything like that. So he's, he's a good boy. Then there's Uriah. She's also back. She's a three-year-old female mixed breed. Um, and she is a big barker. Um, she also doesn't too much like other dogs though. It, you know, again, it depends. Um, she's a powerful, powerful girl, but she's very cute. And she has like a permanent smile face. She's, she's adorable. And it looks like that's it. At least that's uh, who's on this uh, available dogs list. So there you go. And if you want to see these dogs in person, you can't today because they're closed. But tomorrow they open at noon. So you could head on over there. It's 801 Van Camp Road is the Wood County Humane Society. And now we're going to listen to another adventure. Let's see what I have queued up here. Um, let's see. Oh, yes, The Haunting of Sherlock Holmes. Yes, that's what we're going to listen to. So this aired uh, May 20th, 1946, and I'll just let it play. This is The Haunting of Sherlock Holmes here on A Sherlock Summer on WBGU-FM. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and the New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And say, if you'd like to try a new adventure in good eating, will you just make sure that your dinner tomorrow night includes a bottle of Petri California Burgundy? Petri Burgundy is the ideal wine with any kind of meat or meat dish. That Petri Burgundy is a hearty red wine just as rich in flavor as it is in color. It's the perfect companion to a thick, juicy steak or a piping hot pot roast or a good hamburger. You know that Petri Burgundy has a happy faculty of turning a simple meal like, say, a hamburger sandwich, into a feast. Believe me, here is a wine that's clear, fragrant, and delicious. A wine that you can serve to your friends proudly. Petri Burgundy. Remember, the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of America's wines. And now let's join our good friend, Dr. Watson. I, I'm out here on the patio, Mr. Bartell. <laughs> well, I see you're making the most of a wonderful evening, Doctor. Oh, oh yes, my boy. Uh, it's pleasant to sit out here on a summer's night with a good friend and a pipe, a bottle of wine. Help yourself to a glass and sit down. Thank you, sir. Uh, already with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, Doctor? Yes, and a strange story it is. 
It was in the autumn of 1899, Mr. Bartell, that I decided both as doctor and friend that Sherlock Holmes was in desperate need of a holiday. He'd really been overdoing it, huh? Oh, yes, my boy. It had been an unusually busy year, and at the time my story begins, Holmes was suffering from complete exhaustion. So, my boy, towards the end of October in that year, we found ourselves in the charming city of Kazanlak, capital of the small Balkan kingdom of Groznia. A few nights after our arrival, I remember Pavlu Krosnodar, Groznian minister of police, took us to hear the singing of a certain young Hungarian opera star, Miss Lily Reyna, who was then touring Europe. At our table was her fiancé, the charming young aristocrat, Prince Stefano. And it was very easy to see as he sat there listening to the song that the boy was head over heels in love. It was a haunting melody that she sang, Mr. Bartell. I can almost hear it now. Very lucky man, Prince Stefano. Your fiancé's voice matches her beauty. Oh, yes, Dr. Watson. I consider myself the most fortunate man in Grozny. <laughs> he has a magnificent voice, the finest <laughs> singing I can recall since... Since when, Mr. Holmes? I was thinking of a prima donna of the Warsaw Opera who attained considerable success in London, Miss Irene Adler. Oh, by George, yes. She was a criminal, one of the few that outwitted you, Holmes. Oh, that was a case that would have interested you, Mr. Krosnodar. I'm familiar with it, my dear doctor. You are unusually solemn tonight, Krosnodar. Have a glass of wine, and I will bring Lily to our table, and we will toast our happiness. I'm afraid I cannot drink to that toast, Prince Stefano. Why not? Oh, I know why. You, the notorious lady killer of Grotznir, are jealous. You're in love with Lily yourself. Oh. Prince Stefano, I have sad news for you. I have come here tonight, but for one purpose. To arrest your fiancé. What? You're joking. It is far from a joke. At my ministry, we have evidence, conclusive evidence. Miss Lily Reyna is a spy. Spy? Good law. And the penalty for spying in Groznia? Ah, that, my friend, is why I would drink no toast. In Groznia, the penalty for espionage is death. Yes, I know, but Holmes, you must do something to save that girl. You can't just turn in for the night without trying to help her in some way. They might shoot her in the morning. Krasnodar's no fool. Since he's made the arrest, obviously, he has a watertight case against the girl. Uh, I suppose so. Oh, 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 one last pipe. You know, Holmes, I couldn't understand her fiancé's behavior. He didn't do a thing. Just stood there and let Krasnodar arrest the girl. Uh, what could he have done? Krasnodar is commissioner of police. There was no point in arguing with him until the evidence had been examined. Mm. I imagine the prince will try and pull some political strings. After all, Grosny... Come in, come in. Oh, who's this now? Oh, you wish to speak to me? Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I've come to talk to you about my baby. My name is Martha Gret. Your baby? Oh, Mr. Holmes doesn't... Oh, my baby, she is 20 years old, and she is flaxen-haired and beautiful. Oh, well, that's entirely different matter. We'll be delighted to help you, delighted. Sit down, won't you? On whose behalf have you come to me? Poor Lily Reyna. Lily Reyna? Well, that's the girl who's arrested tonight. I am only her dresser. And yet I'm Martha Gregert. I'm her mother and father. I have toured Europe with her ever since she left Vienna. She sent you to me tonight, I suppose? Yes, mm. Mr. Holmes. She said you would understand. Hmm. What does she mean by that, I wonder? She said that Mr. Holmes would take care that a talent like hers should not perish just because she had broken a few laws. In other words... She wishes me to establish her innocence in the same breath as she confesses her guilt. I'm afraid I don't take that sort of plan. Good night to you. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. I am glad that you came to my office this morning. I can show you the proof of Miss Lily Rayner's guilt. As distinguished foreigners, I should like you to know that though the penalty for political crimes is swift and severe, we are most careful that the incriminating evidence is beyond question. Uh, you see these letters? Yeah. We found them sewed into the bodies of her gown. Oh, good gracious me. There are a series of highly dangerous letters from Yosef, the uh, leader of the Revolutionary Party with whom she is uh, obviously hand in glove. Uh, here, you may examine them if you wish. Uh, right. They look like Greek to me. Mm. 
My knowledge of the Groznian language is far from perfect, but these letters certainly seem to incriminate their owner beyond doubt. Uh, you will observe that the, the letters have followed her to each of the cities in which she has been singing. All of them ask questions as to the military garrisons and the chances of a successful revolution. Hmm. She has been a dangerous spy. Yes, I can see that, sir. But even so, isn't the death penalty excessively severe, particularly for a woman? Dr. Watson, the Balkan states are a hotbed of European intrigue. Our penalties must be severe, and we cannot make concessions to the sex of a culprit. Mm. Mr. Josip, the writer of these letters, have you been able to find any trace of him? None. If only we could. But we have never even seen the man. However, we are fortunate to trap his assistant and apparently the lady of his choice. Lady of his choice? But she was engaged to Prince Stefano. Uh, undoubtedly a blind. In her home, we found an unsigned love letter in English. It was in the same handwriting as these letters from Yosef. Are you satisfied, Watson? Well, I suppose... Obviously, she's guilty. Well, there's no place for me in this affair, particularly when you consider that she made a virtual concession in sending her dresser to me last night. I suppose you're right, but just the same. If you were to trap this man, Yosef, I should think you'd be wiser to hold the girl as a hostage. It might bring him on the scene if he's afraid she'll talk. If you hang her, you, you'll never find him. Dr. Watson, in my country we found that prompt justice gets the best results. And for your edification, we do not hang in Groznia. No? The death penalty is exacted at the hands of a firing squad. No. And when is the execution to take place? You have timed your visit well, my friends. Please to step onto the balcony. Oh, yeah. I uh, think that answers your question, Mr. Holmes. Great Scott. Against the wall, blindfolded with the firing squad before her. It's Lily Rayner. Grosnian justice indeed moves swiftly, Mr. Krasnodar. It has to, my friend. Capitano! Mr. Oh. Oh, great Mr. heaven, I can't watch this. I don't care what she's done. I don't want to see it. Up! Two! First! Crumbled to the ground, poor little thing. What an artist. Oh, hard to see a woman executed even if she is a spy. May all traitors to Groznia die as swiftly. Oh, but what a loss. Her beautiful voice. Yes, her beautiful voice. Uh, shall we go in, gentlemen? <laughs> I can still see that poor girl as she crumbled before the firing squad. So can I, old chap. Ah. That's her song you're playing, isn't it? Yes. The melody still haunts me. You blame me, don't you? Oh, oh, blame you for what? For not preventing her death. Oh, of course I don't blame you, Holmes. The girl was guilty. Grosnian law prescribes the death penalty for her crime. After all, what could you have done about it? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And yet... And yet what? I wonder if she was right. I wonder if artistry such as hers isn't of greater value to humanity than spying in any cause. No, uh, it's not much good worrying about that now, is it? The girl's dead and buried. What's the matter, Holmes? Did you hear that? I hear what? I could swear that I heard the dead girl's voice. She was singing a song to my accompaniment. Oh, oh dear me. Your nerves must be in a very bad state, Holmes. Hearing voices indeed. You'd better turn in for the night. Perhaps. It's a... Well, it may be more my conscience than my nerves. Well, I'll give you a sleeping draft if you like. No, 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 my dear chap. I'm all right. It's, it's funny, though. I, I could have sworn that... Oh, well. Play some more of that tune, will you, Holmes? Great heavens! Ah, uh -huh. 
You heard it this time, eh, Watson? Of course I did. It was her voice. There's no mistaking it. Holmes, I don't believe in ghosts, and yet I could swear... Shh. Listen. Good Lord, it is her. Shh. Do not let them go and punish the kill me. Who are you? Where are you? In the air about you. Avenge my death. Strike a match, Sherlock Watson. Holmes. Strike a match. Yes. Light the gas. Look, 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 look. There in the moonlight, moving past the window. It's the figure of that girl that was shot today. A match, Watson. I'll guard the door. There. Gas is lighted. But she's vanished, Holmes. And not by means of this door. She was standing in front of it. And there's no other exit from the room. Holmes, I don't like this. We're dabbling in the supernatural. Ah, stop trembling, Watson. Whatever the explanation for this may be, one thing at least I find quite fascinating. And what's that? It's the first time in my career that I ever had a ghost for a client. <laughs> Dr. Watson will tell us the rest of his story in just a second, so I'm just going to tell you about a wine that adds the perfect finishing touch to a good meal. Petri California Muscatel. With its sunshiny golden color and its full aroma, you just know Petri Muscatel is going to taste good. And it really does. Ah, the flavor of big, plump muscat grapes picked when they're full to bursting with luscious juice. For the wine that everybody likes... Serve Petri Muscatel. You know it's good if it's Petri. Well, Dr. Watson, so you had a ghostly visitor calling on you at the hotel that night, huh? Yes, my boy, and I confess I was so badly shaken by the experience that I, I hardly slept a wink all night. Well, the next morning, after an early breakfast, Holmes and I located the proprietor of our hotel and began to question him as to the history of the building. I've admired the architecture of this building ever since you, uh, ever since we came here. A house of this period would uh, undoubtedly have been built with secret passages and staircases. I confess that I know of one secret staircase there. There may well be others. Indeed, and um, where is the one you know of? Do you wish to explore it, gentlemen? Oh, very much. My friend and I are most interested in such things. Well, follow me, please. Uh, these stairs lead to our wine cellars. <laughs> Thousands of feet have tramped up and down these steps. Only a select few know that behind this tapestry here... Uh, behind this tapestry, gentlemen, is apparently a solid wall. But the wall is not solid. Uh, you have a match, perhaps? Oh, yes, of course. Here you are. Uh, we keep a candle here in this niche for just such an occasion as this. Uh, uh, so, please hold back tapestry, sir. Oh, I, I've got it. Uh, thank you. Now, let me see. One, two, three... Three, four. The fourth brick up from the stair. I press it so, and... Ah. Look, Holmes. Great Scott, a section of the wall swinging up. It's closing a stairway behind it. Ingenious. There, gentlemen. Allow me to give you the candle. But uh, aren't you going to lead the way? Uh, no, sir, I'm not going to lead the way, thank you. I have owned this hotel for 32 years, and yet I have never explored this stairway. Why, sir? Is it reputed to be haunted? Mm, yes, it is supposed to be haunted. I, uh, the candle, mm, gentlemen. Thank you. I... I'm much obliged to you. Come on, Watson. Uh, I shall wait here. Uh, I don't think I care for this, Holmes. Quite pretty dark in here. Damp and moldy, too. Look, Watson. Huh? Look here. Where? It's landing. Landing? Well, nothing but dust. Dust and cobweb. A closer old chap. There's the faint imprint of a woman's heel here. Huh. Oh, my George, yes. Shoes that have gone both up and down these stairs in the last 24 hours. Exactly. And there's a reverse print over here. Hmm. This, my dear chap, I think accounts for the appearance and disappearance of our visitor last night. Yes, but Holmes, it was the singer, Lily Rayner. Yet we saw her shot yesterday morning. Rubbish, Watson, rubbish. What have we to do with walking corpses? Come on, old fellow. Let's see where this stairway leads us to. Oh, but then what did we see if we didn't see a ghost last night? That, my dear chap, is what we have to find out. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Staircase ends here. Yeah, it's strange. Yes, yeah, against a blank wall. That doesn't make sense. And yet the entrance to this stairway was an apparent blank wall, too, remember? Let's see if the same formula will do the same trick here. Uh, what was it? Oh, yes. One, two, three, four. Yeah, four bricks up from the step. I press so and... 
Open sesame. You're all swinging back again. What do we see? Another tapestry. A tapestry that uh, seems very familiar. Well, I should say so. This hidden door leads into your very own bedroom. Exactly, home. my dear chap. Now we know beyond doubt how the apparent ghost made her appearance last night. Don't you suppose it must have been someone impersonating the dead that, girl? That, my dear fellow, is a question that can only be answered by calling on her fiancé, Prince Stefano. Let's go over and see him at once, shall we? Uh, Prince Stefano, I dislike to intrude upon your personal tragedy, but I must ask you a few questions. Ask your question. Did Mr. your fiancé have a sister, a sister who may have resembled her? No. She had no living relatives at all, Mr. Holmes. Well, tell me this. Who inherits her estate, sir? Her dresser. A faithful old woman by the name of Mata Gregor, who looked after her for some years. I see. Did Miss Rayner have an understudy? As a singer, she could have no understudy. She was irreplaceable. You say as a singer. Uh, was she also an actress? Oh, but yes, Mr. Holmes. Oh, really? How very unusual for an opera singer. Oh, quiet, Watson, please. The first time oh. I saw her was in Tosca. She, she was not another baron now, but... Her performance was very promising one, considering her age. In my country, of course, she was not able to appear in anything but opera because, because she could not speak Grosnian. She didn't speak Grosnian? Now I have the answer. The answer? Yes, to what? To this entire story, from the arrest of your fiancé to certain strange visitations at my hotel last night. What do you mean, Mr. Holmes? If you come to my hotel room tonight, my dear Prince, I can safely promise to make the whole matter clear to you. And I dare go a little further. I think that I can even help you find consolation in your bereavement. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I can see that you wonder why Dr. Watson and I have asked you to come here to our hotel tonight. As Minister of Police, I should be stupid if I did not realize that since your other two guests are the Prince Stefano and Martha Gregor, the dead girl's dresser, that this meeting has some bearing on the execution of Miss Lily Rayner. I should prefer to say her murder. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you please, I should like to make my own position in this matter quite clear. Two nights ago, you, Martha, came to me on behalf of Miss Lily Rayner to solicit my aid. I, convinced that she was guilty, refused that aid. Yesterday morning, she died before a firing squad. Last night, her ghost appeared to me here in this room and asked me to avenge her death. A ghost? What nonsense are you talking? It would be no surprise to me if her poor murdered soul came back from the grave to ask for justice, sir. I saw her, my good woman, almost as clearly as I see you all now. I agree with Krasnodar. To talk of ghosts is beyond now, belief. Please let me finish. When I had this visitation last night, I decided to investigate the case thoroughly. I did so today, and I can assure you that Miss Rayner paid for a crime she did not commit. What grounds do you have for saying that, Mr. Holmes? The letters that were supposedly written to her were in the Groznian language. And yet today, Prince Stefano informed me that she could not appear in the theater here because she did not speak the language. But those letters were <clears throat> sewed into her body's home. That's true, my dear fellow. And who was the only person who had the opportunity to do that? The same person who came to me two nights ago and succeeded in convincing me that Miss Rayner was guilty, her own dresser, and supposed friend. Are you suggesting that I'm I... suggesting that you inherited her estate on her death and that you would have lost that inheritance if she had married and had a family of her own. What do you have to say in answer to that, Martha? That I am among madmen. This talk of ghosts proves it. Very well, then. Let the ghosts support my theories. Hand me the violin, will you, Watson, old fellow? Oh, yes, of course. Thank you. Now, turn down the gaslight. Right, sure. That's it. And listen. <laughs> Her voice. And that's her figure standing there in the moonlight, even though she's dead. Now, what do you say, Martha? Aren't you responsible for her death? If her ghost can sing, I'm sure it can also talk. I did do it. The letters belong to me. I sacrificed my own baby for gold. May heaven have mercy on my soul. A confession in front of four witnesses. Why not take her away, Krasnodar? We'll testify later. I will. Come with me, Martha. I killed my own baby. I deserve to die. Well, shall I... Shall I turn up the gas, Holmes? Ask Prince Stefano. No. Do not turn it up. I've seen and heard the ghost of my beloved when the lights were down. I'm not afraid. Please play her melody again, Mr. Holmes. Uh... 
Aren't you uh, afraid, Prince Stefano? Why should I be afraid? Lily, my beloved, your spirit I know can be no evil one. I love it. I love you living. The pleasure of love lasts but an instant. Love's regrets last for a lifetime. This is now my lifetime, brightened by your gracious ghost. I'm sure this is a very touching scene, but it's getting uh, dreadfully maudlin. All right, Miss Rayner, you may come from behind the tapestry now. What's an old chap? Turn up the gaslight. There's a good fellow. Right, you are home. Prince Stefano, permit me to reintroduce you to your far from ghostly fiance, Miss Lily Reynard. Lily, my beloved, you, you are not dead. No, I am not dead. Though I cannot see how Sherlock Holmes fathomed my secret. Huh. And there, my dear young lady, you are in exactly the same boat as I am. Surely the answer is obvious. You gave me the key yourself, Prince Stefano. I did, but how, Mr. Holmes? When you informed me that Miss Rayner had once played the title role in Tosca. Tosca? What's that got to do with anything? Consider oh. the plot, Watson. A minister of police who is very susceptible to a lady's charms arranges a false execution. Knowing Mr. Krasnodar's weakness, Miss Rayner, you prevailed upon him to do likewise. Huh. Well, then the whole execution was a piece of pantomime. The rifles must have contained blanks. That's right, old fellow. And what should have heightened my suspicion, Miss Rayner, was the fact that at the moment of your apparent death, Mr. Krasnodar quoted a line from Tosca. He said, what an artist. And I was not perceptive enough at the time to... Evaluate the remark correctly, I'm afraid. When the simulated execution took place, you were free, but uh, assumed dead. But why should I indulge in such a trick, Mr. Holmes? You reasoned that um, had you come to me directly, I might easily have turned you over as a fugitive from justice. And when you decided to dramatize the situation and appear last night as an apparent ghost, you knew it would, oh, well, at the very least, stimulate my curiosity. It would cause me to investigate the matter and possibly to learn the truth and clear you from suspicion. Well, yes, but Holmes, if, if she's innocent, how about the, the love letter in English which was in the handwriting of Yossip, the revolutionary leader? Well, I can see only one explanation for that. You, Prince Stefano, are that mysterious revolutionary Yossip. Stefano? Oh, no, no, that is not possible. Mr. Holmes, you are a visitor in my country. I do not suppose you will be staying here much longer. Stefano, all these months you deceive me. Silence, Lily. Gentlemen, I hope for your own sake you will not be staying here much longer. Oh. I've been threatened by far more imposing adversaries than you, Prince Stefano. I suggest that you leave my room. It's none of my business dabbling in Groznian political affairs. Your secret is safe. In any case, I came to Groznia for a holiday. Goodbye. Oh. Goodbye, Mr. Goodbye. Holmes. Well, for my soul, Holmes, if we were in London, you wouldn't behave in this offhand way. But we're in Groznia, old chap, aren't we? Hand me the violin, will you? All right, here you are. <laughs> Thanks. You know, Watson, uh, I've only had professional dealings with two singers in my life. The first was Irene Adler, and she fooled me, oh, so cleverly. And this singer tried to fool you and failed dismally. <laughs> Seems to me the scores oh. are not even... No, oh, chap, no. This one was an amateur. Irene Adler will always be... The woman. <laughs> ah, well, I think that's enough excitement for one day, don't you? After all, I am supposed to be taking a holiday. Doctor, that was a swell story. And I'll bet that you were a lot more interested in the beautiful Lily than your story tonight would have us believe. <laughs> well, of course I'm interested in a beautiful woman. But then what man isn't? <laughs> Check. <laughs> but don't worry about me, Mr. Bartell. You know, being a family man, I just naturally associate a beautiful woman and home. And that makes me think of hospitality. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, according to you, I'm interested in home life. You, you're primarily interested in wine. Put us together, and we're interested in... Wine in the home. Well, isn't that an important part of hospitality? <laughs> that I admit. But remember, my interest in wine is entirely an interest in good wine. In Petri wine, to be exact. Because I know all about Petri wine. I know that the Petri family has been making wine for generations. With the Petri family, the growing of perfect sun-ripened grapes and the art of turning those grapes into fragrant, delicious wine is a heritage. 
It's a heritage handed down from father to son, from father to son. The skills of those generations of winemaking are evident in every drop of Petri wine. The name Petri on a bottle of wine is more than a trademark. It's the personal assurance of the Petri family that Petri wine is always good wine. But you'll discover that for yourself. You'll learn that no matter what type wine you prefer, you'll like it better when it's a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes adventure do you have lined up for us next week? Uh, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a most unusual story. Sherlock Holmes crossed swords with a famous Frenchman and proved that although the English have been called a nation of shopkeepers, that a murder did not always prove to be a good bargain. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Sussex Vampire. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and tonight, Dr. Watson was played by Mr. Joe Kearns, who substituted for Mr. Nigel Bruce. Mr. Bruce is scheduled to return to the program next week. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting You're System. listening to WBGU-FM on 88.1 and HD1, Bowling Green, Ohio. Sometimes I wonder what I'm about to do. No, there ain't no cure for the summertime blues. We've got the cure for your summertime blues with the Saturday Blues Bash. DJ Automation starts off at 7 a.m. and leads up to the blues breakfast from 10 to 12 and the Saturday shuffle from 12 to 2. Then Otto returns and plays blues for the rest of the day. The Saturday Blues Bash, all summer long on 88.1 WBGU. To buy your home, you became a house hunting ace. Learned about loans, scoured neighborhoods, and asked the right questions. Now you're queen of your castle. If you manage that, you can get your retirement plan on track. Visiting aceyourretirement.org can help. With 401k tips and smart saving strategies, you'll feel empowered to own your retirement like you own your home. Go to aceyourretirement.org. Because when it comes to clearing financial hurdles, you're an ace. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Uh, no, go away. Oh, I said go away. Oh, blast. Hello. Now, Mr. Rathbone, this is Bert Randall. I'm sorry to have to call you this early in the morning. Early? It's the crack of dawn. Well, not really. Yes, really, I just heard it crack. Yes, but, Mr. Rathbone, this is important. What is? Well, I just came over here to the theater to get some clothes in my dressing room, and I... I saw a man sneak out of your dressing room. After that shooting episode, I thought I'd better tell you. You think he's the man who did the shooting? I don't know. He looked dangerous. I thought you might like to investigate. I never like to investigate men who look dangerous, but I think I'd better. I'll be right over. All right. Hello. We're back. This is a Sherlock summer, and you just got finished listening to The Haunting of Sherlock Holmes. And that sounded like it was uh, Joe, Joe Kern... That was uh, filling in for now. Nigel Bruce playing Doctor Watson for that episode. All right. So, and that uh, that little clip that I just played called "The Crack of Dawn." I have no idea what it's from, but that's what I wanted to play at the top of the last hour. So I did it kind of at the top of this one, even though it's three eleven p.m. on this Monday afternoon. And we are going to continue with the stories. We have one more full length adventure. And then a couple little uh, fun clip things, like what you just heard. So the last one that we have is The Adventure of the Veiled Lodger. And I'm going to play it right now here on A Sherlock Summer on WBGU-FM.
Enjoy. <laughs> From New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> this week's story, The Adventure of the Veiled Lodger. Well, here we are again, about to enter Dr. Watson's familiar study. But, wait, what's this? Boxes and suitcases and trunks. Fishing rods and nets and reels piled up in the hallway. Oh, don't let it upset you, Mr. Harris. It simply means Mrs. Watson and I are about to start off on our summer vacation. Personally, I'd just as soon stay comfortably at home. <laughs> but you know how women are. Have to have an excuse to buy a lot of new summer clothes and... Then they have to go off somewhere to show them off. Oh, yes. Seems to me I've heard you'd bought quite a few new Clippercraft suits and sport jackets yourself, Dr. Watson. Well, you wouldn't want me to embarrass the little woman, would you? Oh, good grief, no. And, and there's uh, one way of making sure the women of the family will be proud of you. Of course, by Clippercraft. All right, you are, Dr. Watson. And now, before you begin the story you promised us, The Adventure of the Veiled Lodger... Which has I'd to like do with to... a very horrible murder that interrupted a fishing trip Holmes and I were enjoying. It was brought to our attention by little Jojo, the clown who traveled with Rhonda's circus. It seems that Sahara King, the lion, had got loose. Hey, and, uh... hold on a minute, Dr. Watson. Before we meet these clowns and lions and circus murders, suppose I say a few words on behalf of the generous gentlemen who have footed the bill for this long and delightful series of Sherlock Holmes reminiscences. That is a motion I second with pleasure, Mr. Harris. Very well, then, Doctor. You can buy clothes for almost any price you wish to pay, but it's hard to believe you can buy such really magnificent suits for only $40 to $47.50, tropicals for only $33.75 to $40, and sport jackets for only $26.50. We're speaking of Clipper Craft clothes, of course. The only way you can prove this to yourself is by seeing Clipper Craft for yourself and by comparing them with suits selling for many dollars more. Clipper Craft clothes are made according to a plan that makes these out-of-this-world values possible. In the Clippercraft plan, 1,036 of the nation's finest independent stores from coast to coast, stores you can trust, voluntarily concentrate their buying power to provide steady year-round operation, reduce manufacturing and distribution costs. Despite rising manufacturing costs, you make a real saving. See your Clippercraft dealer tomorrow. Compare Clipper Craft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, back to our final story. Well, Mr. Harris, when I was packing my fishing paraphernalia this morning, it uh, put me in mind of the horrible catastrophe that interrupted a certain trip Holmes and I were indulging in. Fishing was one of the few sports, you know, that Holmes enjoyed. Yes, the last character in that tragic episode died just last winter. A poor lady who lived in a lodging house in total seclusion, going out only at night and then always heavily veiled. Yes, I have finally decided to tell the case of the double tragedy of Abbas Parva. Abbas Parva. That's a curious name, Doctor. Uh, was it in Italy? No, Mr. Harris. Abbas Parva is a small village in Berkshire. Ronda Circus had halted there for the night on its way to Wimbledon. They were simply camping and not exhibiting, as the place is so small, it wouldn't have paid them to open. Ronder's Circus. Uh, I don't believe I've heard of it, Doctor. Was it a big one? No, well, for those days, yes. Ronder was at one time a household word in England and on the continent. I don't believe he ever went to the United States. He was the rival of Wombwell and of Sanger, perhaps the greatest showman of his day. There is evidence, however, that he took to drink and that both he and his show were on the downgrade at the time of the great tragedy. Well, it was spring, and the trout season was on. Holmes and I had gone to Berkshire to a place we knew for a bit of fishing. Late one afternoon, we received a message from Rhonda's Circus that it was encamped in the neighboring hamlet of Abbas Parva. It seems Jojo wanted to see us. It was a fine evening, so after supper, Holmes suggested we stroll over and have a chat with him. 
Jojo was an old friend of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Mr. Holmes certainly had a great variety of acquaintances, Doctor. Everything from clowns to cabinet ministers. <laughs> yes, quite. And I, I rather suspect he preferred the clowns. He always said they were more human. <laughs> well, we found Jojo behind the cook tent smoking his evening pipe. The peculiar, exhilarating smell that a circus carries with it hung heavy in the still air. I know. It's made up of animals and peanuts and sawdust and canvas and pink lemonade. Uh, that's as good a description as any, Mr. Harris. Well, everything looked peaceful enough, but there was uh, an undercurrent of excitement about. Somewhere in the distance, a lion roared. What's wrong with that lion, Jojo? He sounds uneasy. Oh, you mean Sahara King. Getting near his feeding time. Sounds vicious, eh, Holmes? That he is, sir. Vicious. Came near to mauling Jeannie when she went into his cage for last night's show. Who is Jeannie? Well, now, don't tell me you don't know Jeannie, Mr. Holmes. I'll bell you, Jeannie. The greatest artist on a slack wire this country ever had. Until she cut a ligament in her right leg one night last year when a drunken roustabout hadn't put up her equipment proper like. Yes, sir. A fine girl, Jeannie. Born and brought up on the sawdust and doing springs through a root before she was ten. The prettiest youngster you ever did see. Hair like red gold and cheeks <laughs> as pink as roses. Well, she's only 28 now and an handsome woman still, but uh, she's seen a bit of life, Mr. Holmes, and it's left its mark, I guess. Oh, what happened? Well, when she was going on 18, she married Rhonda. You mean the man who owns this outfit? Yeah, that's him. August H. Ronda. And there ain't a wild animal in any of his cages can touch him for pure damn right meanness and cruelty. Well, didn't, uh, didn't the young lady know that when she married him? Oh, she knew it right enough. Ain't anyone in show business to know about Ronda. She married him to save her dad from going to prison. You see, Ronda got him for forging a check. Some say it was a put-up job. And I'm not saying it wasn't likely. Seeing as Jeannie's father never learned to read or write... Howsoever, Rhonda seemed to think he had a case, so Jeannie married him to keep things hushed up. Yes, sir, that check was for 100 pounds, but I guess Jeannie has had a million pounds worth of suffering since then. Rhonda kept getting worse and worse. First it was drink, then women. And then he took to beating her up. The unmitigated blackguard. Yes. I kind of figure he hated her because he knew he wasn't fit to clean her boots. Always figuring out new ways to torture her. And when she fell and cut her leg and couldn't walk the wire anymore, he said she had to do something to earn a living. He put her in the cages, doing an act with the big cats. You mean the lions and tigers? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Well, Jeannie's always been afraid of them, ever since she was a baby. Couldn't even stand the sight of a common, ordinary house cat. Some folks are like that, Mr. Holmes. Yes, it's a not uncommon phobia. Yes, sir. And so when Rhonda made Jeannie work with the big cats, it was pure torture to her. And maybe he didn't know that. Yes, sir. He even makes her feed them. Says it's because they'll feel more friendly toward her if she does. But between you and me, it's because they always roar so at feeding time. And that terrifies her. You see? Present medieval gentleman, he should have lived at the time of the Spanish Inquisition. Mm -hmm. Look here, why didn't someone in the circus interfere? Go to the police? Well, we don't dare for fear of losing our jobs. Well, besides, what could we prove? Watson, the circus is a world of its own. And the people in it are born, brought up, and finally die under canvas. They travel here and there, never making any real contact with outside life. If one of the performers had stepped in to protect Mrs. Ronda, he'd have lost his job and never been able to get into a circus again, in all probability. Yes, sir, that's right. As I said, the circus is a world of its own. It has its own loves and hates, its own laws and standards. And Ronda is its czar, its Caesar, its god. The circus performer, there is no life outside the circus. Take him away from the sawdust and the circus smells, its eternal wanderings, its audiences, its hardships. And he's as lost and out of place as you would be on Mars. Yes, sir. And that's why no one's ever called in the police. First, because we don't dare, and second, because we don't like outsiders poking around our affairs. How about you're different, Mr. Holmes. You understand us. Besides, you're not a regular blue nose. Yes, that's what he's always saying, not one of the official police. Yes, sir. And so that's why, Mr. Holmes, I, 
I thought maybe you'd kind of take a look around. Maybe, well, maybe you might be in time to prevent something. What do you mean by something, Jojo? First of all, I know, Mr. Holmes, but something's going to happen. It ain't going to be pretty. I got a, a feeling, a kind of warning, and no, I ain't the only one. The rest of them, they got the wind up, too. We don't know exactly why. Yes, I noted that everything was unnaturally quiet as I came past the tents tonight. No singing and shouting, none of the usual couples walking around arm in arm. Everyone seems to be undercover. Yeah, that's what they are, sir. Undercover and listening, waiting for something to happen. Some people say we circus folks are superstitious. You call it what you like. But we always know when something's going to happen. The night before the big blowdown outside of Dover, when 20 people was killed, there was a feeling like this all through the camp. The same way when Lillian Deland's trapeze snapped and she broke her neck. Even the animals seemed to feel it. I tell you, Mr. Holmes, something's going to happen. But we don't know what. Perhaps you do. Subconsciously. I'm afraid I, I didn't get that, Mr. Holmes. That's pretty big words, so whatever it was. Subconsciously. All I mean is this, Jojo. We are aware of a lot of things in the back of our minds that, well, that we don't actually think out. The back of our minds notices a lot of little things we don't even remember. And it adds all these little things together and reaches some rather surprising conclusions. Now and then, these conclusions amount to a knowledge of danger. And the subconscious mind tries to flash us a warning and we feel uncomfortable because we cannot go back into our unconscious minds and dig out the items that have gone to make up the total. Well, if you can't, you can't, I guess. But sometimes you can, if you have help. Now then, Jojo, you say you're worried, and Jeannie Ronda is obviously uppermost in your mind. Yes, sir, I don't feel right about Jeannie. Not since the Hara King tried to maul her last night. No, that's a fact. I see, but she doesn't have to go into his cage again until you reach your next stand. Am I right? Well, no, well, that is, she's supposed to feed him tonight. But I heard her say to Rhonda this afternoon, she wasn't going near the beast again, ever. Hmm, defiance, rather unusual after all these years, eh, Jojo? Yes, Mr. Holmes, uh, now it's an hour past Sahara King's feeding time. He, he's getting worse every minute. Jojo, what has happened lately to give Jeannie Ronda the courage to defy her husband? Well, sir, well, that is, I, I really don't know by rights. But you suspect something. Well, that is, I, well, you know, I, I really wouldn't like to say, you see, well, I'm, I'm fond of Jeannie. Someone has joined the circus lately, someone who isn't afraid of Ronda, but who is fond of Jeannie. Am I right? Well, I wouldn't say he's really fond of her. Maybe it's just because if Rhonda dies, the circus belongs to his widow. And anyone can see that Rhonda's liable to have apoplexy any day if he don't give up drinking like a sponge. But, well, bless me. How did you guess, Mr. Holmes? Nothing persuades a woman to defy one man as quickly as the knowledge that there's another man to back her up. And who is this chap who isn't afraid of Rhonda? It's Leonardo, the new strong man. He's handsome, all right, strong as an ox, but I don't trust him, Mr. Holmes. He don't look you straight in the eye. Oh, I'm not blaming Jeannie. I guess compared to old Rhonda, he looked like the angel Gabriel. And besides, he's the first man that ever did show her any attention. She's been pretty lonely sometimes. Do you think Rhonda suspects this uh, attachment? That I don't know, Mr. Holmes. I wish to heaven I did. Seems he came home unexpected last night. As a rule, he sits drinking in some pub or other until closing time. But last night, he came home early. And Jeannie wasn't in their wagon. He liked to tore up the place. Whether he found out something, I couldn't say. I wish someone would feed that beast so he'd stop that caterwauling. It gives me goose flesh all up and down my spine. And well, it may. If he ain't fed soon, it won't be safe for anyone to go in his cage. Yes. Come along, Watson. I think the sooner we reach it, the better. Oh, you mean you're going to interview that lamb? What? What do you think it is, Mr. Holmes? What's going to happen? I'm not certain, Jojo. But doesn't it strike you as curious that if Rhonda isn't going to force his wife to feed the beast, he hasn't sent someone else to do it? You think he's just letting her put it off until the beast's in a filthy, dangerous rage? In a killing rage, perhaps. By Jiminy, that'd be just like him. To make her go in there, and not a chance of exactly. it. Exactly. And no one could ever prove he meant to kill her. Well, we must be almost there. That beast sounds unpleasantly close. Just around this tent, sir. Holmes, why are you cocking a revolver? You don't oh, actually think... Listen, no, someone on the other side of the tent talking. Oh, yes, you will. Think you're going to find me, my girl? I'll show you. But I'm afraid. Oh, Augustus, please, just this once. It's them, Rhonda and Jeannie. 
Open that cage and get in there. I'll flog the skin off your back. I'll show you who's your master. Thought I didn't know you were sneaking out, knights. Unlock that cage! Oh, hurry, women, stop her. She can't go in there. Sahara's out of the cage. Shut her down. Put her in her face. Stand back, Watson. I'm going to shoot. You, you got him. You got him. Jeannie. Jeannie. Are you hurt? Her face. Oh, it's torn to pieces. She, she's covered with blood. Oh. Oh, Jeannie. Jeannie. Easy Jeannie. there, Jojo. Easy. Watson. Is she dying? Oh. No, I, I think we can save her, but she'll be horribly disfigured. Oh. And this man over here, I take it this is Rhonda. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Sahara must have got him, too. He's gone, I'm afraid. Back of the skull completely crushed. Good Lord, that animal must have had a paw like a sledgehammer. Look how the claws tore the scalp. Hmm. I wonder. Well, I must say, I don't see anything to wonder about, Holmes. The lion escaped from the cage and went for both of them. Yes, but why not the other man as well? What other man? The one who screamed and ran away. Oh, coward. He could have saved me. The makers of Clippercraft clothes are thinking not only of the suit you'll buy tomorrow, but of the suit you'll buy next year and in the years to come. That's why you can always depend on the Clippercraft label. Why Clippercraft makes a business of bringing you one of the greatest values in America. Behind that smart looking Clippercraft suit is the amazing Clippercraft plan, responsible for Clippercraft's unique values. You get the benefit of tremendous savings through the Clippercraft plan, whereby 1036 of the nation's finest independent local stores from coast to coast voluntarily concentrate their buying power. Because of this plan, your fine new Clippercraft suit costs only $40 to $47.50, your tropical only $33.75 to $40, and your sport jacket only $26.50. For selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. Be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suits, sport jackets, and tropicals. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Now, back to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. We find Holmes smoking his pipe deep in contemplation as he waits for Dr. Watson to finish caring for Mrs. Ronder. The night is black and breathless. Even the animals are hushed. A heavy-footed figure approaches. Well, Watson? She'll live, but she won't enjoy it, I'm afraid. Hmm. Horribly disfigured, eh? Look here, Holmes, it's getting late. Let's be getting on home. There's nothing more we can do here. After all, you can't arrest a lion for murder, you know. If it was a lion, Watson. Oh, what do you mean, if it was a lion? We saw him, didn't we, tearing at that poor woman's face. I'm not thinking about the woman, Watson, but her husband. He was lying fully ten paces from the cage. I doubt if the lion ever got that far. Oh, rubbish, Holmes. You're trying to build bricks without straw. This isn't a case for the police. Perhaps not. It may very well be a case for Sherlock Holmes. Oh, that's conceit, pure and simple. Come along, Holmes. I'm nearly dead for sleep. So you don't think it's a case, Watson? No, I don't. Hmm. Then would you mind telling me what, to your way of thinking, did happen? Well, that is, it was, it's all rather obvious. Jeannie Ronder opened the cage, the enraged lion jumped past her, killed her husband with a blow, and then returned to finish her off. It was the back of Rhonda's skull that was crushed, remember? Well, naturally, he turned and ran when he saw the beast coming for him. And the man's voice, the man we heard shouting for help? Oh, Holmes, don't be pig-headed. Of course Rhonda called for help when he saw the lion was out of control. You mean to tell me a man can still cry out with the back of his head battered in? Well, no, that is... And we could still hear his voice after his wife's cries had been stilled? 
Well, of course... Furthermore, we... Rhonda's body was lying with the head pointing towards the cage, not away from it, as would have been the case if he'd been running away and attacked from the rear. No, Watson, Rhonda was facing the cage when he was struck down. Struck down by the man who called for help but ran away when the lion, infuriated by a smell of human blood, turned on Mrs. Rhonda. Yes, but... Uh, That's but... why she kept saying, coward, he could have saved me. That man could have driven off the lion with a weapon used to kill Rhonda if he hadn't lost his nerve. Yes, but look here, Holmes. Rhonda was killed by the lion. He must have been. The marks of his claws were left on the skull. You saw that yourself. Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. Oh, there you are, Jojo. What does she say? Did she see who killed her husband? She won't talk, Mr. Holmes. I can't get a word out of her. But I, I think she knows right enough. Oh, it, it's terrible. She just lies there, moaning and crying for Leonardo. Hmm. And where is that gentleman? I tried to find him for her, but they tell me he went off to town soon after supper. Well, yeah, there he is now, coming up the road from Abbey's Parva. Yeah, I must run and tell him what's happened. Jeannie wants to see him. He's the only one who can comfort her. Oh, that should be an interesting interview, Watson. Suppose he wandered over to Mrs. Ronda's wagon. I believe it has a convenient window. You, you mean you're going to eavesdrop? That is my intention. Holmes, have you no moral scruples? None whatever, my dear Watson. None whatever. Here, Watson. Get down behind these bushes, out of the light of that window. Yes, but I, I shan't be able to see anything. Have you no moral scruples, Watson? Oh, we don't have to see. All we have to do is hear. Quiet. Here come Leonardo and Jojo. Hello, Jeannie. Leo. Leo, why did you do it? You promised Shut me. Shut up, will you? Jojo's here. Oh, I, I, I didn't know. I, I can't see with these bandages. Yeah. Just told me what happened. Met me on the road coming back from Abbas Parva. I'm sorry, Jeannie. He got pretty badly more. Yes, I, I... But that doesn't matter. Oh, Leo, we won't have to run away now. Rhonda, he... He's gone. We can get married, decent-like. Married? What makes you think I'm going to marry you? But Leo, you promised. You think I want to be tied up for life to a woman with only half a face left? You might as well expect me to marry one of the freaks. Leo. <laughs> Leo, don't laugh. It's your fault that Sahara mauled me. You could have driven him off with the club you used to... Now shut up, you fool. Shut up. Don't you do it. Don't you touch her, Leo. I'll warn you. Well, listen to who's talking. Jojo, get out of here before I cripple you so you can't walk. Now get out, do you hear? Leo, don't hurt him. Jojo, please go. You can't do any good. We we get on better if we're alone. Please, Jojo. All right, Jeannie. But just you let me know if you don't treat your right. Go on, get out before I kick you. I'm going, I'm going. <laughs> you ought to see him run. <laughs> Nasty brute. I'd like to Quiet, Watson. <laughs> Quiet. Leo, you didn't mean what you just said. Oh, didn't I? I'm pulling out of here tomorrow. But Leo, the, the circus, it's mine now. You can have it if we're married. You always wanted to run a circus. No, sir, I'm sensitive, I am. I never could stand looking at an ugly woman. Why, I'd as soon as marry a gargoyle as a woman without a face. But Leo, I can wear a mask. No, it's no good. I'm clearing out of here tomorrow. No, you're not. Well, who's going to stop me? I will. I'll go to the police. I'll tell them that you killed Rhonda. They'll arrest you. And what about you? Your hands aren't any too clean, remember? But, but I didn't kill him. I didn't know you were going to. All I wanted you to do was keep him from sending me into that cage. And who's going to believe that? We're in this together. You can't hand me over without putting a rope around your own neck. But I didn't do it. I didn't. I never wanted him killed. You can't do that to ah, me. Shut up, you hysterical. You can't leave me like this, Leo. Now let go of me and stop screaming. You want everybody in camp to hear? I can't. I don't care. I won't let you go. <laughs> That's good, that is. Won't let me go. How are you going to stop me? And another thing, I never did love you. Oh! Now, do you get that? Never. All the time I was after the circus. But now I don't want it. Not if I've got to have you along with I'll it. I'll kill you, Leo. I'll kill you for this. Go ahead. You haven't got the nerve. Well, I'm going. Leo. <laughs> Leo. <laughs> Holmes, you're not going to let him go like that. He's guilty. Cut him. Cut him. <laughs> Holmes, she shot him. Quick, Watson, we've got to see him. Perhaps he's not dead yet. I wish we'd stayed home tonight. Here he is, Watson. Help me turn him over. Right, who? Yes, he's dead right enough. Hit between the eyes. Nice shot. 
So she did have the nerve, after all. No, Watson. Jeannie Ronda did not shoot Leonardo. Yeah, but, but Holmes, look she here. She couldn't. Her eyes were bandaged. Come along, Watson. We're going home. I think I could use a bit of sleep myself. But I say, Holmes, look here. Aren't you going to stay around and find out who shot him? I don't think I want to know, Watson. We solved the first murder. That's enough for one evening. Besides, did I ever tell you that Jojo's father was famous for his tricks with a rifle? Yes, I believe his sons weren't half bad, either. But, Dr. Watson, didn't the police ever discover who killed Leonardo? No, Mr. Harris, they didn't. His body was discovered on the road to Abbess Parva. I dare say some of the circus people suspected the uh, culprit, but circus people are notoriously close-mouthed. Well, Doctor, there's one more point I don't quite understand. How did the marks of the lion's claws happen to be found on Ronder's skull if Leonardo killed him? Well, it was really rather simple, Mr. Harris. Holmes eventually found a club with five spikes in it at the bottom of the scum-covered pool in the neighborhood. I don't believe he ever mentioned the fact to anyone, however. Well, that was certainly a very powerful story, Dr. Watson. In fact, Doctor, I'd say it was one of the best stories you've ever told. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Harris. I, I like to finish on a high point, don't you know? But uh, you're not going to go away and leave us for good, are you? You, uh, you really want me to come back in the fall? You know we do, Dr. Watson. Why, the week would be kind of empty without a Sherlock Holmes adventure to look forward to. Well, in that case, I think it could be arranged. <laughs> All I wanted was a little coaxing, you know. <laughs> well, then consider yourself coaxed, Dr. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Harris. And a most heartfelt thank you to all our radio friends have, who have so patiently listened to the reminiscences of a venerable medico who was fortunate enough to become the biographer of Sherlock Holmes. And last... But by no means least, thanks to our generous sponsors who have made these half hours possible. You know, Dr. Watson, I sometimes suspect they are Sherlock Holmes fans, too. I hope so, Mr. Harris. I certainly hope so. And now a pleasant vacation to you and all our friends. The same to you, Dr. Watson. And uh, have fun in your new Clippercraft wardrobe. <laughs> Makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. John Stanley, known best to you as Sherlock Holmes, has turned author. Be sure to read his article, Powder Smoke, at 221B Baker Street in the current issue of Black Mask magazine, now on your newsstand. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Well, cheerio, Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson, and members of the Clippercraft radio audience until the fall. Best wishes for a most pleasant summer from the makers of Clippercraft clothes for men and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast. Remember, we'll be on the air again next fall when Clipper Craft will again bring you the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> this is Cy Harris speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes. This is a mutual broadcasting system. Following station identification, you'll hear Melvin Elliott reporting the latest headline news. Blasting the campus voice since 1947, right here on 88.1 WBGU. <laughs> Did you hear that, kids? You too can join the international humanist conspiracy. All you have to do is listen to the World Music Show. 
That's right, music from everywhere but here, Sunday starting at 6 p.m. on WBGU 88.1. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. I'm the designated driver. It's so darn cool. I will make sure that we follow the rules, so I'll pledge. No beer, wine, or liquor. And, and drive, drive you home safely. safely. Cause it's two tickets to a World Series game. The reward for responsibility. Team Coalition thanks you for being a designated driver. Visit rhir.org. All right, so that was the last of our Sherlock Holmes adventures, and I had forgotten that that was The Veiled Lodger. I didn't make the connection between the title and the adventure, but that is one of the more horrifying ones, honestly. And interestingly, um, in at least two of those adventures, Holmes, like, didn't uh, didn't, uh, you know, do anything with Lestrade or like the police. He was just like, you know what? We're in Groznia. You know what? This is the circus. The, no police. And he just like, you know, lets it go according to his own moral scruples as he said he didn't have any false. All right. So now we're going to play a couple little things uh, with Basil Rathbone, a couple little radio things things that he did uh, one is called word detective and the other is beyond the green door i think i'll do word detective first so he basically just tells you about the oh what is it etymology is that the word for where the word comes from where where it was first started and this word is stoic let's take a listen you may live among completely modern furnishings in a 1959 model split level house in the newest housing development in town but your vocabulary, nonetheless, contains a touch of ancient Greek design. We'll be exploring this relationship between the creation of an Athenian architect over 2,000 years ago and our present-day speech on this edition of Word Detective, prepared as an educational service of this station in cooperation with the Underwood Corporation, leaders in the field of typewriters and business machines for more than 60 years. 2,300 years ago, among the favorite sightseeing spots of the thriving Greek city of Athens was the bustling local marketplace. One of the favorite sites there? An open colonnade at the north side of the market decorated with colorful panoramic scenes of great moments in Greek history. The paintings were big, impressive, and created by a famous Greek artist named Polygnotus. But the tourists, in truth, weren't nearly as interested in the pictures as in the Athenian citizens who strolled on a covered porch in front of them. Just as Hollywood sightseers flock to a restaurant where they have a chance of seeing Marilyn Monroe in person, so did these visitors hang about the porch on the north side of the Athens marketplace. Since Athens was at its peak quite a few years before the invention of motion pictures, the sightseers came not to ogle at movie stars, but at another sort of celebrity, philosophers. The professional thinking men in these filterless days of ancient Greece did most of their thinking in public places, in stores or temples or public baths or perhaps on street corners. Beginning in about 300 BC, a goodly number of them made their headquarters every day on the open public porch where Polygnotus' illustrious battle paintings were displayed. They talked, they argued, and interested citizens were welcome to listen all they liked. In time, the influence of these thinkers spread far beyond Greece. But no matter where they lived, the followers of this philosophical school referred to themselves as if they had developed their ideas in the shelter of an Athenian marketplace colonnade. To people who seem to follow these philosophical ideas today, we give the same name. I'll type it out for you right now on my Underwood typewriter, the only typewriter with the golden touch. The word is stoic, currently used to describe someone who seems not to be affected by passion or feeling someone who's indifferent to either pleasure or pain. We get the word stoic from the school of ancient thinkers who established indifference to pleasure and pain as a philosophical goal. The ancient thinkers got their name because they hung out inside a painted porch in the Athens marketplace, such a porch in Greek being a stoa. On tap for next edition of Word Detective is the story of a murder case which greatly shocked the citizens of the 12th century and gave us a word. Don't go away now. I'll be back in a moment.
I just realized I wasn't supposed to tell you what the word was. You're supposed to guess by what he says. So that was my bad. I will try and remember for next time. <laughs> All right, so we have just one more short little thing. Uh, this is a Beyond the Green Door thing. They're like mini uh, Twilight Zone um, twist, scary twist stories. Um, this is, you know, you know, three, four, sometimes five minutes. So short, short little fellas. And this one is called One Wish. Also Basil Rathbone narrating. This is Basil Rathbone inviting you to join me beyond the green door. Today's story is about Frank Davis, a man who learned to his sorrow how to penetrate beyond the green door. Frank Davis was a man with an obsession. Others like him collected mountains of newspapers or miles of string or they spent a lifetime trying to devise a foolproof betting system or a surefire way of beating the stock market. Frank Davis' particular obsession was magic. He lived alone in a rented room and his only companion was a cat. His chairs were piled high with books, his walls were covered with sorcerer's tools, and his closets were stuffed with herbs and essences. People left him alone, and Frank liked it that way. He knew that someday he would find the proper spell and a demon would appear and grant him one glorious wish. At night he dreamed. By day he worked on his formulas. His black cat lay nearby, her yellow eyes half closed, looking the very soul of magic and Frank labored on, testing the infinite combinations of his formulas. He had grown so used to failure that success caught him by surprise. One day, a wisp of smoke appeared in the middle of his room. The demon slowly took form, and Frank, who had dreamed of this moment for so long, found himself shaking with fear. Somehow, in all those years, he had never decided exactly what he would ask when a demon did appear. The wisp of smoke grew into a huge gray shape. He paced up and down, wrung his hands, stroked his cat, gritted his teeth, bit his nails, and desperately tried to think. One wish, and only one wish, that was the rule. But what would he wish for? Wealth? Or was power more valuable? Should immortality be considered? Or would a more modest wish be safer? The demon was fully formed now, its pointed head brushed the ceiling and its lips were twisted into a devilish leer. Your wish! The demon bellowed in a voice so loud that both Frank and his cat backed away. His wish. Hmm. What was it to be? The moments were ticking away and the demon was growing impatient. If he didn't hurry, the demon might leave, never to return. But after 20 years of striving for this moment, Frank wanted to make the best wish possible. He thought again of the various advantages offered by power or wealth or immortality. Then, just as he was about to decide, he saw that the demon was grinning at him. It's irregular, the demon said, but I think it fulfills the conditions. Frank didn't know what the demon was talking about. Then a wave of dizziness overcame him, and the room went black. When his vision had returned, Frank saw that the demon was gone. His one great chance was wasted, and everything was just as it had been. Well, uh, not quite as it had been. For Frank noticed that his ears had grown long, and his nose had grown even longer. He had gray fur instead of skin, and he had a tail. That treacherous demon had changed him into a beast. There was a noise behind him, and then Frank realized what had happened. He ran with the speed of desperation while the room loomed hugely around him. A single blow smashed him down and he saw a fierce whiskered face above him with gigantic teeth ready to bite. And Frank knew that his hesitation had caused his doom. It was horribly apparent now that his cat had made a wish, which the demon had accepted. And naturally enough, his cat had wished for a mouse. Oh my, do you see what I mean? Did you expect the cat to have made the wish? Craziness! That's what they're all like. Tune in next Sunday. It will be Sunday, my regular time, 
4 to 6 p.m., yes, to hear another one of those, another word detective, and another three full-length adventures. This has been a Sherlock summer. Uh, Tune in later tonight, 8 to 10, for me to be on here again talking and be playing music instead. I don't know what the theme is going to be yet because I honestly forgot that I had my show tonight. Um, But it'll be something. It'll be a bunch of fun, fun music times. So have a great rest of your afternoon and evening. Bye-bye now.